Everyone, we're waiting for a couple more minutes, uh, and then we'll definitely start. Sure. Okay, let's begin. We have some people here. There is a proportional interest on YouTube as well right now. Uh, okay, so uh, hello everyone. Good evening. Happy Sunday. Uh, and welcome to our Growing Up in Science talk today. Our guest today is Dr. Vinita Bal. Uh, and before I introduce her, I would like to talk to you about what Growing Up in Science actually is. Uh, so it's a talk series where we invite accomplished people in science to talk about their academic journey and career with a focus on their doubts, D2 struggles and failures that they face along the path to where they are today. Now, why are we hosting this? It's because when students look up to scientists, established figures in science, their trajectory seem to be intangible. So here where they provide the behind the scenes view of their career, you see the, whether it's generalizable or not, we believe this can foster a culture of openness about personal issues uh, and 
inculcates an understanding that professors are human as well and letting young people know that some of the feelings that they struggle with are shared uh, and yeah you definitely get to know them which is uh, one of the more uh, interesting aspects of this uh, our guest today is dr vinita wal the dr vinita wal uh, she <laughs> she is an immunologist and a visiting faculty here at iser pune she obtained her md in microbiology from the hafkin institute in mumbai after completing her mbbs after that she went for a postdoc and shifted into research she has worked in, as an immunologist with wide ranging interests uh, she was a staff scientist at the national institute of immunology delhi for 26 years before she came here to iser pune she teaches a couple of courses in, in immunology here uh, which are quite popular other than that she is a feminist and an activist she was also the part of the national task force for women however that was her official story and we today have gathered here to learn about her official unofficial one welcome thank you yeah so let, let's uh, start from the beginning could you talk about your you know family upbringing and education back in those days sure you have to remember that uh, we are probably tracking something that was prevalent in pune because i was born and brought up in pune until i finished my mbbs i was a puneite and uh, that was a very different era of pune um, 60 years ago whatever i am 65 today so we are talking about uh, early 60s early 70s that that kind of period which is so different from anybody who is a punekar would appreciate um, i was born in a lower middle class upper caste brahmin family and the uh, reason why i'm mentioning this is that it has impact on how one grows up what one encounters and so on for example uh, i said lower middle class and this is something that you may not be able to imagine not because uh, the well probably not because you haven't uh, experienced it or seen it but in those days in those years um, even food there was something called ration nowadays we also hear about ration card but it is meant for really poor people but in in those days the, the green revolution and its impact on availability of grains was not present so there was grain shortage so i remember going through meaning my family going through sort of shortage not uh, in not enough sugar available and uh, rice that you get is in the uh, shops russian shops is pretty bad so this is something that i'm describing because it also told me um, that there is poverty one can be denied of various things and that is something that is normally uh helps in your growing up or at least contributes in your growing up that was the reason why i did mention lower middle class as a family upper caste has its own advantages and disadvantages as well as we know it there is significant cultural imprinting there is really impact of religion on one's uh, growth rituals on one's growth but i must admit that uh, my family though there was an rss background in the family we were not a very heavily um, religious family there were issue there were some pujas that would take place but it wasn't like a very serious event i think religiosity or demonstrable religiosity has gone up in in the uh, society with passing years and nowadays we talk a lot more about it in those days there wasn't such a there wasn't so much of a uh, discussion at that point but i would say that uh, the the uh, cl- class and the uh, caste actually resulted in my going to a school which was nearby school and schools also i would say educational instit- uh, institutions themselves were of a very very different kind at that time they were there was no business model for educational institutions so there were government schools and there were also schools run by various trusts which also charged very minimal fees 
So I went to a very uh, Marathi medium school, which was run by a trust. So in a sense, one can call it an NGO run uh, school, but it, the NGO was not for profit. What you see now as education is for profit. So that difference also makes an diff uh, impact on the way things are taught, the way you think, people who are around you. So people, uh, students from, uh, or my classmates were mostly from this, a similar background. And I must admit that there were sort of two, two shifts to the school, morning shift and afternoon shift. There was division between morning and afternoon shift in the sense people who, students who were brighter, so-called meritorious would be attending afternoon schools. I happened to be in the afternoon uh, shift of the school and that resulted in a significantly homogeneous distribution of my classmates. That's why I wanted to uh, make this point that it was, as I said, lower to middle class. It wasn't the case that we had no relatively well-off people in the school, in my class, but all said and done, all of us were pretty much middle class. And I do not recollect, um, knowing is certainly a very strong word, but even noticing students who are either from um, uh, different religions, that is Christians or Muslims, and certainly I do not remember having this notion that there could be so underprivileged caste wise, what we call as outcast or in today's term, what we call as scheduled caste, scheduled tribe students. They were nowhere in the horizon as far as my schooling was concerned. So in that sense, it was a very protected, homogeneous a kind of atmosphere in which I grew up. And there was no gender bias at that time, fortunately not in my house. And there were minor issues, but they were, for example, in school uh, for, well, I come from a stage when uh, the board was class after class 11, there was not 10, 10th and 12th board. So this was class 11, which was the end of the school. And then we had four years of college to a degree. So that was a slightly different thing. The distinction between boys and girls was, very clear to me in class 11, which was the final year, girls were asked to wear saris as uniform and boys were let go. In the sense, they could wear half pants as we called them, they could wear full pants as we would call them, but there was no compulsion either way. We were made to wear saris and I remember that was the first anger and protest that some of us actually uh, clearly mentioned in the, in the school, not that it had any effect at that time, but it was a very clear distinction which became apparent as I was growing up. Until then, I hadn't really discovered this. We used to play, there was schools into school events and all sorts of things. So education was in Marathi. Uh, and only when I entered, finished class 11, as it happens, I was, uh, also uh, at, uh, in the board's top, toppers list of some first 50 or first 80, whatever, I forget, it was too far back. But it was something that growing up and uh, getting dis uh, discriminated is something that I started noticing at that point. Another interesting story that I would like is like to mention is the coaching classes. The coaching class culture is very, 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 very strong now. Everybody who appears for entrance exam is going through coaching classes. And uh, we see now that women are not really women, meaning girls at that age, I suppose, um, are uh, not really encouraged to go to coaching classes, especially from small towns because coaching classes are after schools. So this, uh, they, they could be seven to nine or something like that, which I have heard enough uh, number of times. But Coaching class uh, culture wasn't there, but there were certainly teachers who would take extra efforts to train uh, so-called bright students. And I, I remember a Hindi teacher of mine, I was very fond of him, very good teacher. He, uh, he trained some seven, eight, nine, nine of us for Hindi so that he wanted a board prize for topper in Hindi, obviously. So uh, the last day of training, just before the, uh, before the exams, he told us today is the last day. 
and uh, now i have a strong request for you i have a faith in uh, god ganesh and those of you who are from pune probably know saras bag as a temple which is uh, there for for this ganesh for god ganesh so he said that my request is all of you please go and visit that temple pray to the god and then then appear for your exam and i don't know from despite my culture despite some bit of religiosity at home uh, how did i say this but it was out of conviction i told him sir i will not go to the temple i don't believe in god i believe in your training and i i here i am so i bent i touched his feet and i said no i'm not going i'm telling you outright and everybody else of course four five six the rest of them actually went to the temple and as it happened and this is somewhat immature on my part i suppose but i actually got prize as first uh, standing uh, a topper girl student in ssc board and when shah sir came to came to my house for congratulating and told me the story i said sir now you know that god doesn't exist i did not pray to him but i i touched your feet and that was more beneficial to me so in a sense uh sort of not getting con very conventional not believing in god asking questions wherever i could was something that was probably there and eventually i suspect with my friends with curiosity and other things it it was nurtured rather than anything else that i can say that somebody influenced me somebody did not influence me but with time i became a complete non believer in religion and god and today for i don't know for how many years but i would say i am a complete atheist and i think and i take decisions rather than praying somebody or asking somebody to do something for me okay so uh, well, that's that's one story that's <laughs> <laughs> uh so uh, did you have uh, a moment moments of attraction to science or did you want to become a doctor always did someone tell you to become uh, go for an mbbs uh, how 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 did that work again and uh, as i said it would go back to the time when i was growing up uh, you people have quite a few opportunities and when i was growing up there was only uh, uh, if if you if you could do well in science then there were only two options either you go for engineering or you go for medicine and there were very very few government uh, mostly government colleges which were the uh, engineering colleges or medical colleges and there was very little opening uh, of the private sector so the seats were limited and uh, the usual th that is what i was saying that uh, culture has its own uh, imprint on you if a girl student is uh, really good and wants to uh, pursue a career engineering was not considered for her it was automatically as if i would not know chemistry or mathematics or physics but automatically the inclination was that uh, girls and women should go to medicine so without thinking at too much i had enough marks to get admission to bj medical college in pune uh, and the choice between so called mathematics versus biology was decided after first year of college and we went different ways there were very few students from uh, women students from my class who went to engineering college really really few and in a class of 200 in bj medical college when i entered uh, in 70 1974 much before anybody's time uh, it there were at least there were i think 50% girls in in my class of 200 and there were probably not even 5% uh, girl students in the engineering college so it was such a dichotomy which was given again that i don't think i actively thought about why should i go to medicine if since i had maths and i i wanted to uh, become sort of you know careerist i i opted for medicine i continued with that but medicine was a shock i must admit that there were us who were quote unquote toppers from from the second year college who entered medicine that was the the one 
what should I say, op eyes opening up to the reality was happening in multiple ways. As I said, from the homogeneity of my uh, uh, school class, I entered a place where there were uh, reserved category, so-called reserved category students. And there was significant proportion of them. And we got integrated since our um, attendance was in alphabetical order. I had many um, SCST students, so to say, I know I'm using this jargon, but uh, essentially there were many SCST students amongst us so that they exist and they are part of this culture and that society treats them otherwise so badly is something that sort of started dawning on me when I entered medicine, not before that. And also medicine taught me something else that, uh, well, all of, many of us, I must say, in anatomy exams, we had a little bit of um, whatever, some demonstrations, some tutorials, and then brief exams like we have quizzes in ICER or other exams. And almost all of us, of course, including me, failed miserably in first two or three exams. And that was also a shock that until then there was nothing like, you know, failing. And then it didn't count in the final marks, but it was a shock that uh, bright students, so-called brilliant students can fail so miserably. And all, it ha all that happened was I had to change the strategy of studying, study a little more than taking studies very, very casually. So that resulted into cutting down of my, some of my extracurricular activities as they were called, like table tennis, which I used to play for many, many, many years. I was also, as it happened, school national level champion. But after entering medicine slowly and steadily, all of this simply withered away until, until of course I finished MBBS, but I haven't seriously played after that. So these things do happen. And these are the choices in a sense that, uh, again, I have seen in many of you in, as a younger generation, you are generally encouraged, you know, women are encouraged to learn dance, music, boys are also encouraged to do many things as sort of given. It, it was not the case. And also, uh, this was a question that was always asked that uh, how, if you want to survive in this world, the sports, being good at sports is not going to take you anywhere. You have to have a career. You have to have certain degrees, certain qualifications before you can think of anything else. So it was also a case that if you are not good at studies, then willy-nilly parents might say, okay, if you can't get anywhere in the studies, might as well try sports. So this was... This was a very, what should I say, a bad treatment which was given to certain aspects of one's life, but that is how it was. And I'm glad that things have changed much for, for better for you guys, assuming you most of you are here, very young. <laughs> yeah, uh, by the way, I would just, just like to mention, uh, if any of you want to turn on your videos, ask questions in between, uh, all of it is welcome. Uh, yeah, so... Well, around college time, you know, everyone, like, at least it, it has been my experience and my peers' experience probably, that we start comparing ourselves to each other, whether, whether we are smart enough or not, or did, did, did those things happen to you or, yeah? Uh, smart enough? Huh, I don't know. I never thought about it. Uh, there was also, I must say, that consciousness about one's looks were... That, that kind of attitude was much less prevalent where, wherever I was, neither in Ferguson College, where I spent two years, and then four and a half years in BJ Medical College. And I remember noticing women who, would, who made up. So lipstick was not common in those days. And uh, all sorts of I suppose what I would call visits to beauty parlors were not common. Certainly boys did not go to beauty parlors and I was very aghast and I must say how silly of me, but when I was in NII, that was much later, when I discovered that one of my colleagues actually has very nice eyebrows, first I thought, 
wow, he has very nice eyebrows. Then I discovered that it wasn't natural because eventually you do see some hair, you know, popping out here and there. So even men go to beauty parlors is was a cultural shock to me. And uh, I only go to, this is a confession in a sense, that I go to beauty parlor only to cut my hair as short as possible. And beyond that, I don't step there, step in there. So the so when I say that, this, this uh, not noticing it, not wanting to be smart, <laughs> won't come as a surprise. But mo- many, many students around me were of the kind. And I, I see boys and girls who are now in their 60s, I should not call them, uh, boys and girls, but my classmates do look different. They they lo- do look smarter. But honestly speaking, I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn about looks. Uh, honestly speaking, I I think, and this could be, you know, my ego, my pride, maybe undue pride. But I I like to appreciate people's intellect and their sincerity in work and their uh, drive rather than their looks. So this is something that I have always thought as higher priority in, admittedly, in my judgments. So there is a prejudice in that. I uh, accept Mm -hmm. that, but that is how it is. So whether I was smart or not wasn't an issue. I don't really know. (laughs) It's the correct answer. So uh, during your MBBS, did you want, like, uh, I don't know, how did you feel about doing the MBBS once you were in there? Uh, did you want to continue did, or not wanting to continue? It was uh, one of the reasons you you know decided to shift. Actually, it was not very interesting at that point, especially the first year, because I don't know how many of you have seen, but anatomy textbook is a real fat textbook it, it is sort of you know 1600 pages or something so i was simply ca- talking to somebody uh, that grace anatomy is used to be about 1600 pages or something then physiology textbook would be about big size 200 300 pages biochemistry so i'm talking about first mbbs only biochemistry was again 200 300 pages and that actually taught me that you can read, if at all, or everything that is part of your curriculum only once. There is no way of going back. So if, if I want to read, I should read carefully and uh, decide that this is it, no going back again. And this continued even for surgery and medicine, which were third MBBS uh, subjects. But that is something that was that put a lot of pressure but I enjoyed once the basic anatomy uh, was over I enjoyed physiology immensely because it taught us taught me about functions of various parts of the body you have to know the body and then you also know how the body functions that functioning part was extremely uh, interesting for me and I knew with that that I, I will probably sort of you know focus myself on that rather than anatomy which is a focus normally that surgeons have or biochemistry most of you after bsms would probably go to cellular molecular biochemistry cell biology so that area was also something i did not find great interest in in the first year first mbbs i should say medicine was interesting because again there was enough logic that was being applied to it rather than just the hand skill set. I'm not demeaning the surgeons. We have a great value for them in the sense. But at the same time, what one must realize is that uh, the physicians do the differential diagnosis, as I would call it. So if somebody comes with symptoms, where the symptoms fit the best is decided by the physicians rather than the surgeons. And that kind of thinking, again, I'm going back to ability to think and ability to arrive at a decision, a diagnosis, whatever you call it, as as something that I always appreciated. And by the time, I mean, I enjoyed immensely the teachers who taught me uh, medicine because that was the process of thinking was really good, but appearing for exams was very tough. 
and i must admit that uh, i had two serious failures in everybody else's eyes in my career which i can mention uh, as otherwise was quite bright and uh, uniformly smooth one was in the ssc i forgot that that was the board exam i had relatively speaking very poor marks in two sciences that we had general science and physics chemistry were two papers and i had 75 and 78 marks and that is completely uh, low marks uh, when all all the people who came into the board along with me had probably 85 90 and so on and so forth i i don't know what politics played out there i didn't expect to get such few marks but i was less upset than my father was and i thought to myself it's all right i mean so just one exam and i got over it earlier than my father and that is something that i thought to myself that he is probably too old i have much more life ahead so i need to move on and think what i can do so that was one the th- second one that's why i went back to this was in the uh, final year exam of um, medicine in that also i got relatively speaking very poor marks so my ranking in the final score in third mbbs wasn't the best that one could have had of course it wasn't bad but i mean i was not a topper not that i probably deserved to be deserved to be a topper but certainly in medicine the subject i liked from the last third mbbs subjects uh, i didn't get good marks the other subject that i liked and i got good marks was preventive and social medicine so during mbbs it's a hard grind absolutely hard grind and uh, most people do not enjoy it as i said i enjoyed clinical uh, going into the wards examining patients looking at the diagnosis putting things together and that was very very interesting and challenging but as i said because i did not get very high rank in medicine that made me think during my internship as to what am i going to do after mbbs so it in again the not getting good marks was a second negative uh, thing that happened in otherwise bright career i suspect i should say but uh, that made me think about what is it that i would like to do after mbbs uh, i certainly wanted to be uh, independent on my uh, standing on my feet on, uh, as a as a careerist uh, woman so i knew that i have to uh, pursue the career but i was also looking for something that will keep my interest and i wasn't sure what would keep my interest forever this is something that i keep telling to everybody every student i talk to don't expect me to tell you what you should do you have to think and you have to decide what is it that you would like and what is it that is likely to keep your interest and uh, i during my internship i read quite a few things and uh, i realized that i would like to pursue research because in a way this is not something that doctors like to uh, listen to and agree necessarily but if i become a general practitioner i know you people go to doctors also there is a cough there is a cold there is a diarrhea and there is fever right this is the primary complaint with which we go to a doctor and you can imagine how boring it would get after a few years except for seeing happiness when the person the so called patient is cured that if that happiness can keep me happy then only i can continue this kind of practice that's what i discovered during internship because i was actually dealing with the patients and i thought no this is not not as interesting uh, despite finishing mbbs that's why i moved to research and it was a very untrodden path at that time medics never practically never meaning you know we talk about three standard deviations so it is outside of that <laughs> that's the frequency which uh, medics go into the research and i happen to be one of those it was a difficult choice but i did want to have a balancing act what if i do not like research so i chose to do md rather than phd because after md i can still go back to a hospital or whatever i do 
I will practice, I will earn my living, even if I have to leave research out. But it was during my MD in Havkin Institute that I started research. Initially, it was sort of a pharmacological research, drug uh, testing kind of research, then into immunology. And by the time I finished my MD at the end of three years after MBBS, an internship, I knew I, this, is, this is the field for me. So it was a change. It was still a compromise to do an MD and not a PhD. But I, I thought the risk was worth it. Even today, some people uh, tend to ask me, when did I do my PhD? And I don't have one. You people will get it eventually. I don't have one. I spent <laughs> enough years even getting an MD. Didn't think it was necessary. <laughs> so that, that's how I sort of changed the path primarily because the, the practice, routine practice of medicine, I thought I could not continue with. Yeah, uh, uh, Shankar has a question. Shankar, would you like to unmute yourself hello, and ask? Hello, am I audible? Uh, and can you show me your face, please? Okay, ma'am, uh, my internet is like a no, kind you of- show, show it for a fraction yeah. of a second. Yeah, second. one second, ma'am, yeah. <laughs> Both, yeah. This is something I know you can ask me question, but I have started hating simply saying names because last two, close to three and a half terms, this is what I've been facing. I really do not like to teach <laughs> when it's completely. I'm sorry about it, but one it second, ma'am, one piling second. Up. Uh. <laughs> Jitesh, it is not like that. Okay, earlier it was more conversational. I can see you in front of me, so. Okay, um, uh, is it, is it, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. You can you uh, can go go back to <laughs> whichever form. But yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh ma'am, uh, so thing is that uh, so when you start I guess you started your MBBS or I think you're almost 60 right now, correct? If I'm, I'm right. 65. 65, okay. Uh, so you have you're my grandmom's age. Oh, yeah. That is I mean okay. many of you. I don't know <laughs> how old your grandmoms would be. Oh damn. Okay. Is, okay. Nice. That I, okay. I mean, if you're if you're first, I mean you're fresh BSMS student or even fifth year BSMS students, yes. I'm much older than your mom's uh, uh, parents for sure. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so the thing is that so so you be you you might be probably doing your uh, MBBS at uh, say 1980s or something in mid some earlier. earlier than that. I, I entered first MBBS in 74, okay. uh, four and a half year course and plus one year internship. So by 79 October November I was through with my MBBS. I had a degree in hand. Okay. So so the, my question is so at that time so whatever medical technology whatever we are seeing today is like is didn't exist didn't exist at that point of time even medical understanding is like very primitive and the whatever biochemistry is like very 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 you know backward understanding of biochemistry at that time right so the thing is that you witnessed all of this transform evolved right you know whatever happened so you know so what is the difference between the medical textbooks that study that you studied at that point of time and then subsequently, whatever is being taught today. I mean, I don't know whether you're uh, keeping on updating medical textbooks. And... I, I don't know, honestly speaking, how, what kind of biochemistry is taught today. But you know, in India, the uh, syllabus does not get updated very fast. So ICER syllabi are old, 15 year old, mostly, and the courses offered are probably the same, except that uh, Satrit and I have been teaching immunology now, which was there, but probably a different set of immunology. Whatever it is, I'm simply uh, sort of making a general comment that syllabi don't change very much. Anatomy certainly cannot change. It's, it's Anatomy means what is the structure of a human body? I mean, we know a little more and little more, and probably uh, immune system and nervous system are two systems in which a lot more is has developed and our understanding has evolved significantly. But how our muscles were and which muscle starts where and goes where, that difference, that, that is not changed. It is a fact. So anatomy has not changed. I'm sure physiology has changed very, very significantly. I don't know what gets taught though. And I know, unfortunately, that immunology that is taught in medical schools is very pathetic. 
yeah they they still use the same old same old but it's also very pre- preliminary um whatever 10 five classes in of immunology or something so they they will not be expecting uh, to learn students will not be expecting to learn a lot more than what i learned for example as immunology in uh, second mbbs part of pathology microbiology teaching so uh, i don't know biochemistry should again be there but what you have to realize is that biochemistry is also basic i mean you probably know i don't know uh, shankar where which senior what seniority you are oh, oh, i'm third year oh, third year so you you know very well that first two years or first one and a half year now in icer are common courses so yeah. essentially mbbs is like that it's common course after you came okay. after your 12th we went to mbbs essentially after our 12th it wasn't the 12th at that time but now after 12th students enter medicine so basic biochemistry whatever has not been taught or even taught in class 12 will get repeated same kinds of information so the difference will be physiology difference will be human anatomy because that will be very much more, more extensive and will not be taught in ordinary bsms kind of students or in biology and ultimately medicine where the di- medicine and surgery where diagnosis and treatment comes into picture the most interesting part which you people never learn about and we learn over a period of 3 years is preventive and social medicine which is a serious part and which is normally very ignored part but that's what what i'm saying that even in physiology uh, in preventive and social medicine probably somebody should introduce covid and the pandemic again i remember reading about pandemic and the definitions at that time but obviously i hadn't seen one over none of us had seen one so despite my 65 years i hadn't seen one and now the preventive and social medicine uh, syllabus should also modify to provide a lot more about uh, new infectious diseases i'm sure it is happening but nothing happens um, to uh, uh, in a very updated fashion so um, very very old and orthodox teaching practices still continue in medicine like they continue in um, standard uh, bsc and msc courses as well okay ma'am so uh, you said you started some preliminary research in your md so what aspect of that did you like the most and when you shifted to doing uh, your post doc did like uh, did you observe a cultural change or did that aspect that you liked before did it, did it, did that change or did that leave any uh, effect on you it well i i did two projects and yes that shaped my thinking process again and i i would give a little bit of background here first project ever that i started doing research on was looking for so called uh, so called ayurvedic oil i do still don't know what that oil was effect of a particular oil which was given by a vaidya uh, this ayurvedic system as you know uh, very well known vaidya to see if it had any effect on Uh, diphtheria on wound healing on this on that and so on and so forth so this is the kind of study which even continues today not necessarily with that oil but with ashwagandha with whatever even in covid 19 pandemic we saw very many people claiming very many uh, miraculous cures and so on and so forth but when i when we had some interesting results from that oil and then ultimately we uh, my boss at that time asked the vaidya to disclose the ingredients so that one could dissect out and do research as to which component of the oil was responsible for the observations that we were ob- uh, getting and they were interesting observations and it, it had potential possibly to treat dip- diphtheria and uh, this is so the vaidya said oh no 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 that is a, tra- a trade secret i cannot tell you this is not something that uh, that can be done and that was the end of research okay this probably made me think a lot more actively about what the research is about the openness transparency whether it is a chase for knowledge or whether it is chase for my own importance and how big i am 
either as a doctor or as a vaidyan i will not um, provide any information about the ingredients was a major major trauma and i moved from there for for my md dissertation to uh, a pathologist uh, immunologist and he gave me an opportunity to develop what you would call an elisa today it was a very primitive elisa for the diagnosis of tuberculous meningitis i did that for over a year year and a half probably two years so at the end of which and, and this is just an information that it was extremely useful assay to develop so his notions of what was needed for tuberculous meningitis diagnosis was spot on i was simply you know a worker and was uh, was learning things but even today tuberculous men even not i shouldn't say today but in those days diagnosis of tuberculous meningitis would take 3 weeks because that cerebrospinal fluid had to be inoculated in a culture tube and wait until mycobacteria grow and then only you know the diagnosis so essentially it was a blind treatment which was uh, offered uh, based on the clinical suspicion and the test rudimentary test that i developed provided an answer at the end of 24 hours and then there was a correlation between cases that were tuber tb meningitis not tb meningitis standard things that research will te teach you eventually and i thought this was such a great thing and unfortunately my boss at that time tried to do some commercial uh, utility uh, explore explore for commercial utility of it because it would have been really really useful and there was no way i had finished my md by that time the project ended these are the unfortunate events that you will notice you will come to experience as you move on but that's what happened but how to uh, identify a problem and how fi to find a niche where you can actually be useful this is what would call, one would call as translational research i did not that word was not popular at that time as it happened i did trans some translational research left it at that point but my interest in infectious diseases remained there because i later on as a first postdoc i also worked on hepatitis so tb hepatitis all of these were sort of you know giving me an idea about what research problems there are and how to handle it or how to address frame of research question and how to move on so that's something that was very useful from there i haven't worked on necessarily a single disease thereafter because from infectious disease i focused a lot more on basic immunology thereafter so questions were about mechanistic understanding of various questions in immunology and but this background and this is something a uh, background which helped me even in the last two years to think about covid-19 sars cov 2 what are the issues the pathology the immunology and epidemiology in public health so in a sense whole research career which i had not spent even a, a minute on covid-19 but it didn't feel like you know this is something that is such a big question mark it was a question mark but it was a challenge intellectual challenge to read about it to think about it based on my understanding of immunology epidemiology and many other issues that that i had dealt with during sort of very long career so um like uh, our generation is just too used to the you know world being accessible at our hands when you applied for your postdoc how i don't know i can't even imagine how you did that <laughs> so could you share some like <laughs> well in that sense i have seen a lot of transition i must admit that when i wrote, uh, wrote for uh, i made applications for postdoc when i to get that international the blue colored envelopes which were airmail envelopes right letter actually type letters on a typewriter there were no computers and uh, it took whatever 10 15 days to uh, for letters from india to reach to united states and probably at the end of about 3 months or so one would expect a reply if there was a reply to come and one blindly went on sending a few letters but uh, i was lucky enough to get a postdoc in london and i don't know whether i had another offer in us i what for whatever reason at that time again possibly tuberculosis but i joined mrc's tuberculosis unit uh, in london 
because I I have I was interviewed in Bombay itself. Somebody the boss was uh, visiting India, so he interviewed me in Mumbai itself. It was Bombay then, Bombay and Mumbai in different languages, but uh, it was in that sense very different. And at at that time, even my early students, I do remember telling them that the, you better start writing letters six months in advance. Do not bank on last minute writing. And even today, I don't think yeah. uh, the this same exists even today. I guess it it is true, but it is what you have. What happens is you hit uh, send, and the mail reaches somebody's inbox. Whether you get a reply is another matter. But not having computers, uh, my MD dissertation was typed by somebody on a uh, typewriter, and we needed six copies. So there were five carbons put one on the, below the other. and it had to be properly typed so the sixth copy which was with me for many years was practically unreadable so uh, i mean it you can't really expect the sixth copy to be readable if somebody is typing even if it is hard hitting typing so with after that there was typewriter i remember learning to do the typing because to send letters i thought handwritten letters don't look good so applications were on borrowed typewriter single digit a single finger initially and then it eventually three four fingers but uh, those th- that is how it was and i have seen computers arriving one at, at one corner of the lab not everybody can use it and eventually now you guys have probably laptops from uh, maybe class 10 i have no idea or maybe earlier but uh, that that is a very very different world and we we had a slow movement even manuscripts took 6 uh, 6 six, six months 8 months for all sorts of communication including galley proofs coming and you correcting by hand on the printed copies and sending it back so the world moved very slowly at that time so it is hard to come to terms with it but i suspect even this fast moving world has been i mean i've been in it for 20 years so it it doesn't feel that unfamiliar any longer but unlike you at least i know what the slow world was so you went for a uh, post doc you worked in a lab and then you started setting up your own lab so uh, can you describe the uh, we would love to hear anecdotes from you and you can uh, like describe some you know experiences with you got from your advisor and then you became a mentor and then you gave advice uh, i should say something about mentorship i must say and this is something that that is a grouch that many of icer friends of mine have heard uh, from me that i dislike the word mentor i dislike the notion of mentorship uh, and i must admit that i have always thought about what next so uh, in in a sense i'm i should say i'm proud but i am a rational human being and i like to take people's or listen to people's advice and then make my own decision and be responsible for my own decision so i nobody told me to do the md because i mean i was that that was the balancing act that i described but that is something that is in a sense something that i always uh, did in my life that i listened to people i asked for input and then decided for myself so i cannot say that i had one or two or three or five mentors i had respect for some of my teachers i did not feel particularly happy about certain other teachers and that experience i'm sure you also have uh, so in that sense i wasn't mentored because i did not seek for such mentorship because in mentorship i think there is an issue of i am going to tell you what to do it doesn't always translate like that but there is that sense that i have because i'm senior i'm more experienced i have seen the world this is what is best for you so go ahead and do it like your parents probably do my parents fortunately did not do it or maybe i was i did not listen to them i don't remember any longer but they they did give me advice but sometimes i did not listen to them is also correct this is something that you guys i see uh, as you know 
parents do take significant interest in your careers and drive your careers at times. Forgive me for saying that not everyone is like that, but this happens. And in a sense, parents are your not just parents, but mentors. And I don't like the idea. I think from the age 18 onwards, when we get voting rights, when we become adults, when we are majors, in that sense, we should actually start thinking and taking decisions and implementing. In that sense, I do not like the mentorship word. And to all the PhD students, I had some 20 plus PhD students over whatever, 25, 26 years in NII. And everybody, I would say, look, you can come and talk to me about what you want to do about postdoctoral choices or your life or something. Do not expect that I'm giving you a decision. We will talk. I don't mind talking to you because yes, I might be able to uh, provide some uh, avenues to think which you may not. Decision has to be yours. And I remember this may sound odd, but um, a student of mine who finished her PhD went to NIH, spent quite a few years. And after many years, she came back uh, and uh, was meeting me in my Delhi office in, in NII. So her parents were there and I didn't know what to say to parents. And so she and I talked and uh, then her parents asked her to go out because they wanted to talk to me specifically. So I was getting curiouser and curiouser. And then they told me, uh, Madam, please tell our daughter that she should get married now. And I thought to myself, what? At that age, I'm going to tell her to get married. I, and I told them that this is not an advice that I would ever give either to marry or not to marry. But people have to think for themselves. And I'm sorry if you, if you are feeling disappointed, but this is not something that I will ever tell her. So these, these kinds of demands are also expected. Um, that's super awkward, ma'am. Like, that is super awkward. Like... It is. Of course, it was awkward. It, like, <laughs> see, but the thing, most awkward thing is that one of my friend is getting married and it is more awkward than, yeah. So one of my <laughs> school friends is getting married and, you know, but, like, uh, no, it's a distant. All, all I'm saying is that these kinds of awkward situations also one faces. But, I mean, I remember this because I was so taken aback that, for, for probably a fraction of a second, I couldn't respond to, to them saying, I mean, what am I going to do? And then they were disappointed and <laughs> they just left soon after that. And the student came in afterwards and said, what did my parents ask you? Did they ask you to do this? I said, yes. And how, how, how did they expect you to tell me? I said, yes, quite correct, but they don't know me. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> they tried their best. Anyway, about about setting up a lab, it's an experience that that is different for everybody. And I would say that um, the major issue issues are of two kinds. One, you are new to to a place. Normally, you done postdoc somewhere or the other, and normally where you do postdoc, you don't get employed immediately as a faculty member so that's a new place new colleagues uh, you don't know how much money you will get you don't know if you have stayed for five six years outside this country and come back getting to, coming to terms about what infrastructure is available how do you develop it all of this is very very difficult to come to terms to and there are many issues which Ultimately, you have to learn from your peers, talk to them, uh, and then hand, uh, move on. The, the most important point is also about what will you decide as your trajectory of research. So it's not easy to decide it. Many, many of my new colleagues, I'm noticing that they work in very high profile labs in, in outside the country. And with this omics kind of approaches that you have seen, that for a certain condition, there were omics done, 
transcriptomics done and there were five genes isolate, I identified as contributing. The postdoc mentor is so-called postdoc mentor is uh, following two, two of those genes. And as, as a fresh faculty, I will follow the third and the fourth. This is something that is the bread and butter proposals that most people come up with. Please see to it that you don't fall into that trap. It's easy to do it, but you are competing with your postdoc mentor, okay? Postdoc supervisor, advisor, whatever you call it, call him or her. But if you are doing that, obviously, who is going to win the competition? Not you. There is experience, there is name, the person has published a lot of material and you are starting afresh. At this time, the overconfidence comes into way. More, many postdocs who are really good and productive postdocs as first author, uh, authors on good papers think that the world has accepted their competence. It is not their competence. It is their uh, supervisor's competence which has gotten there and they have published well. So that transition is extremely important. And you may not think of what you will do for the whole life ahead, but at least if you have a couple of areas which are not overlapping with whoever you worked with, it is harder to uh, pursue, but eventually it gives you, I think, um, independence, a trajectory to chase, and also if there are failures to face failures. Okay, wow. Uh, uh, Jitesh has a question, can you quickly take it? Sure. You are mute. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No, so I was just uh, to build off on your uh, conversation about mentorship. Like I wanted to ask you your opinion about the current way PhD is done. And so your opinions about that and any uh, thing that you would like to change in the whole, the way system of PhD is done. You know, in India, uh, PhD is, okay. I see PhD as training program. Okay. I do not see PhD. Uh, I do not like to see PhD students dragging on their, um, duration of PhD for to six years, seven years, unless they are particularly problematic, meaning either, you know, some major problem in career has arisen or the person is extremely, um, what should I say, bad hands. I'm talking about experiment case. I have no idea about theoreticians. Or if uh, there is uh, some, so there are issues about problems not working out and so on and so forth. This is something that I have tried to do that unless the women students were pregnant or unwell or whatever, and hence they took six months off their five year duration, I insisted that at the end of five years, students should submit their thesis. There were some men students who were also notoriously bad and they also did not finish on time. But out of whatever 20, 25 students that I've been 21, 22, whatever the number is, probably only three or four did not submit at the end of five years. And at that time, of course, the, uh, prob the issue was that UGC was not as silly or, uh, and insisting on two first author papers or two papers and so on and so forth. There are reasons why these clauses have come up because the education has much is much more widespread now and hence uh, bad events crop up quite often. As a result, what would you have as achievements which can be documentable, one paper here and one paper there? So when that gets documented, then you have permission to submit your thesis. And sometimes it's also the case that uh, investigators do like, and this is something that I will also con confess that when you are in your fourth year or fifth year, your hands are so well trained that the success rate of experimental outcome is much higher than it was in the second year. In the second year, maybe only three out of six, seven experiments work as they should be. I'm not saying 
this is the result i want but i'm talking about positive control negative control working and you getting results data so that frequency goes up significantly and you hardly ever have a failure so when that happens the work output is so much that papers can be manuscripts can be written much faster they can be published you get more credit the pi gets more credit all of this is is something that i understand but at the same time i have a tendency not to drag on because the student gets frustrated and also the sort of you know interest is is uh, going down at that stage in the 6th year and the 7th year so i am very very much against dragging the phd to 6th and 7th or 8th year many institutes take pride that our phd's phd's are so good that they take 8 years i i don't have such pride not in myself neither in my students i am very very what should i say more practical in this matter that if they have been trained they have been trained they should be able to find their ways outside do post ops if they want go to, go and get jobs whatever they want so in that sense but in providing complete independence to students for their phd's is much beyond anybody's capability uh, in experimental science in india we do not have freedom we do not have so many resources to waste and also as i said i like five year as as the slot in which i want to train student and if somebody wants to get trained under me but where i don't have expertise because the person has come up with an original quote unquote original phd problem i don't like that because I, it's my competence which gets challenged and it will eventually i will get there but the time lost is time lost so in a sense i would rather ask students to come and join me and which is something i did that these are the areas of my interest if your interest uh, match these or if you are okay working in these areas we will work together for example i never worked in cancer and there were students who wanted to work only on cancer immunology and i i remember very clearly saying i'm sorry i will not get into cancer immunology because it's a very new area i will need to build infrastructure i will need to build conceptual framework before i can guide you so students are not so smart that they can completely independently do their phd work this has been my experience good students bad students anybody maybe i didn't have very brilliant students but my students were some of them were very bright so i wouldn't say that uh, only only uh, extremely bright students need independence sometimes that backfires also sometimes students are too overconfident and that also backfires and it needs to be accepted that overconfidence is is not a good idea so i'd like to ask uh, one last question and then we can open up to and this question is main uh, and probably why many people are listening to today uh, and so how did you get into activism and you could tell the story from you know your what your personal experiences was growing up and what which people you met what you read and you know to where you are today yeah <laughs> uh you know the activism or awareness i would say of of life is responsible for activism to me in in my in the in a sense that i told you about the homogeneous school class then noticing that there were underprivileged students who were my classmates in medical college then i noticed so obviously there was discrimination which i noticed then when i went to hafkin institute for the first time i uh, talked i should say and became somewhat friendly with uh, people who were either christians or muslims there were no sikhs or jains or buddhists at that time that i was aware of but again the heterogeneity is something that i started noticing and that heterogeneity also was responsible for making me aware of many things for example i mean in in mumbai itself my activism in a sense started because i uh, started working with a, 
on the health issue of workers' health and safety. Asbestosis, for example, is still an unrecognized disease. It's an occupational hazard, but it is still unrecognized. And I was thinking that, no, this needs to be accepted as an occupational hazard. So that was sort of a beginning. But when I was in London, two things happened. One is, in addition to uh, everything else, the racial discrimination did come my way. So uh, it wasn't something that was out and out racial discrimination, but you know, most discriminations are subtle. If there is too, too out and out discrimination, then there are ways of punishing, um, mending, but discriminations are of this kind. And that is what came my way. Also, the, I was in London from um, 1986 to 90, four years. At that time, the LGBTIQ community had not had so many alphabets in it. But it was a beginning, very active process that I also noticed. And I also noticed the subtle discrimination that these, the, uh, the LGBT community, community was also facing. Along with that, I realized that as a woman, I also do get uh, treated differently. And I told you the story about uh, needing uh, sari as a uniform. That was the beginning. But we do get treated somewhat differently. And there is a patronizing attitude and the, this kind of discrimination that I've been talking about based on class, caste, religion, uh, sexual orientation, or gender. All of them are, well, sort of became one after the other, became very, very apparent to me. And for that reason, I actually start, started, I actually came back to India with this as a major issue in my mind, that I do want to give back to my country, whatever I have learned, and I would work, which whether I produce anything or not, I don't know, but even knowledge that one creates is useful in terms of talking, uh, giving it back to the society, to the community, to the students, to the researchers, whatever. So that was very clearly in my mind. I had never intended to stay outside the country forever. And I came back, which was a surprise for many. But also I wanted to uh, connect with the society after I came back. I realized that in London, while I noticed racial discrimination and discrimination of the sexual minorities or sexually different, uh, sexual orientation, different people, that kind of people, this, this is something that one, I did not get, I could not connect with the society while in London in those four years, which meant that my culture, whatever you call it, I can possibly come and talk to people I grew up with. And for that, you need common language. Not that I did not know English when I was in London, but the social language I did lack. If you, if you know what I mean. When I came back to India, I chose, I opted to work or I that chose uh, places to work when I was looking for three, four, five opportunities. Either I wanted to work in Maharashtra or in Hindi speaking area because I know Marathi very well and I know Hindi reasonably well so that I can talk to ordinary people outside the, the scientific community. So these were issues that I did take seriously at the time of coming back. And when you think of activism, you know, you do need sort of mental peace and drive both because there is some sort of altruism and selfishness both in activism. Altruism in the sense that I'm trying to do something or help, quote unquote help, and that sometimes sounds patronizing, but I'm trying to do something which other people deserve and are not getting. So thinking about somebody else in this fashion is what I would call altruism. And for that, you need mental peace. And um, you also, there is selfishness streak in it, in the sense, if I have done something all my life for a category of people, for a group of people, and if I see improvement in their performance in whatever indices that I care to measure, if there is improvement that can give me satisfaction and happiness also, 
not that it comes very easily but that part is sort of selfishness as i would call it and here i would point out one thing why i actually was interested in working uh, on the issue of women scientists because most women scientists do not have leisure to think peacefully okay so yeah. they are in a hurry to look after their lives their families their research career their everything else that is happening around them even to think of a new research problem you do need some peace of mind and not running around co continuously that is not there to almost uh, not available to almost all women scientists that one sees around me everybody we don't notice it men have more leisure women have less leisure because they work at home also the responsibilities that the society puts uh, on women in this patriarchal structures is huge and that is the reason why my inclination to work with women scientists grew with time when i realized that most women scientists around me their competence sort of you know doesn't come up as much as it should have bright women scientists do not manage to be productive why does that happen for a variety of reasons about which we will not go get into the details but those were the issues which actually made me think talk about write about women scientists and in whichever small fashion one could work towards their betterment their prospects improvement providing them more facilities so that their research can be more productive all of these issues were part and parcel of my thinking process because of this context does that answer sort of without an anecdote yeah uh, yeah um i think we have two raised hands uh, manas would you like to go ahead yes yeah, sure so now again um thank you all and uh, thank you for the great session so you mentioned that you like to uh, my social medicine and uh, like my friends uh, uh, from medical school are generally of the opinion that the worst of it ever exists and sorry sorry manas uh, uh, switch <laughs> off your video i can't hear you probably you don't have good connection probably sorry about the it. mic ha uh, whatever it's better, no? better probably yeah okay so you mentioned that you like preventive and social medicine uh Like, but I, my friends from medical schools and in general, uh, medical friends are of the opinion that one of the worst subjects to ever exist. Um, so, what is uh, like? What made you like uh, the generally non-like subject? And did you ever think of pursuing it as a career? Uh, because you know it has a lot of social component. Because even you are like also working as an activist, right? Absolutely. Uh, so what you know, there was a textbook called Park. I forget who. initials or something but it was parks textbook of preventive and social medicine which we read and we visited kastur uh, kasturba hospital no whatever else, naidu hospital naidu hospital in pune as part and parcel of that so preventive and social medicine program and i th what i realized was that there was so th therapy is something that most doctors practice that you provide a ready solution to a person coming in front of you and you see happiness so this is like being playing a god uh, to to the mm -hmm. patients which is what most doctors find rewarding and uh, i i don't necessarily feel happy in that situation and i felt that preventing illnesses is a much better way of looking at the society and probably it is likely to be less expensive way of Uh, doing it than than just simply treating individually one by one because in a preventive approach you are treating the whole community and when you are treating a patient you are treating one single patient so that was also something that was of interest to me and yes i seriously considered um, doing md in preventive and social medicine if i didn't have so i had Uh, thought of possibly neuro neurobiology, possibly immunology, and possibly preventive and social medicine as three different areas I would like to chase. Preventive and social medicine, I if I had 
uh, opted for i would have done it in pune in bj medical itself because i could have gotten a postdoc uh, admission for md there itself but somehow research uh, in was an unknown in the sense and i i read something some uh, books in immunology in during my internship so that fascinated me the most so eventually getting into research and then of course finding opportunities for research because again there was a prejudice and bias that medics do not necessarily are uh, medics are not normally encouraged to enter lab research i didn't know what the lab research was so a, a pharmacologist in afkin institute whom i went and met actually offered me a research fellowship in itself was a break since i got that break i could move on further but otherwise and i have done this in in uh, my uh, uh, career as as a faculty uh, in nii that whenever mbbs students or md uh, those who had finished md wanted to do research i actually encouraged them none of them were really interested or stayed on but yes that is that is something that is useful and as i said social angle was very much in my mind i would have done it if i had uh, not obtained not gotten a chance to work in hafkin institute for for sure thank you for answering uh, uh, yeah prarabh uh, would you like to unmute and ask a question uh, yeah sure uh, so this is me um, hello uh, great session by the way um I, i just wanted to ask uh, how many academics in the indian landscape would you say hold similar political and social opinions as you do and and would political differences with your doctoral advisor or any mentor affect your career in academia if it does by how much okay i am a minority in okay the, in the in the for, in i response to your first question that there are uh, science research in fact scientists live in ivory tower is what everybody used to talk about and yes most scientists still live in ivory towers and i'm very happy that i am in icer because i have seen i had seen i should say a lot more openness amongst the faculty members some discussions which extended beyond simple trajectory of doing research and many of you including a, a project like kalpa the prutha and many other projects of uh, many other activities of this kind that you do are really something that i have uh, admired i don't know how it started because i wasn't here when i sir started but if i was staying on the campus i would have probably more actively participated in it but essentially i think most scientists do not look outside of their very narrow terrain of whatever they are doing as research and are very mm, what should i say socially unaware creatures extremely yes, unaware creatures and creatures i'm not saying demeaningly it's like you know uh, one can call uh, human beings as animals similarly creatures is is ordinary usage Uh, so this is something that i do see as a prob uh, as something that's common the way i said medics moving into research is extreme minority so also uh, the the scientist having opinions about on social issues is again a minority category for sure uh, some institutes have somewhat best, better percentage of such uh, scientists some uh, uh, institutes majority of the institutes do have even worse percentage that's one point the second point you asked is about political opinions and uh, the conflict about research yes it does happen it should not happen is what i think but it's also the case that many people many scientists do have all of us i am not an exception all of us expect certain output of science and research from the students and there is an av- there is a average and there is a range some people are much more productive some are much worse but there is a range and if you are falling outside of it then uh, in my mind if you are spending a lot of time 
if i discover that you this low productivity is because you are spending a lot of time in other activities as i as an individual as, and as an advisor would worry and talk about it it is not about political opinions in that sense but if you have undertaken phd sincerely and if you want to do it sincerely then there is certain expectation and if that expectation is not getting fulfilled and i'm not saying a very narrow range but there is a range for sure and if that that is you know, that is not happening then what i was saying that somebody might take 7 years instead of 5 and then i have to find money for those additional 2 years and then why should i find money if you haven't been a sincere student when i say you you know you it's a general statement but this is something that does happen but real political differences is a more complex issue and i think in this case church and state should not be coming together they should be kept separate and they haven't been kept separate especially in the last 5 7 years we have been seeing that there is a a what should i say a religion a religious assertion is increasing within academic spheres which it should not have increased not it should not have increased at all that doesn't mean there should not be personal opinions but those personal opinions should not color and come into the uh, praxis of science that's what i think and that has been happening so if tomorrow for example somebody asks me that whether i would like to do research on gomutra and there is crores of funding because it is research on gomutra then it is this kind of conflict and i would worry about it first i would not probably take money on on for that kind of research because it goes against i mean i i if you were there from the beginning the uh, ayurvedic oil research hmm. which put me off of this kind of stuff is a prejudice but at the same time i i am i have medical background and i am very much for clinical trials openness testing of the drugs and so on and so forth so gomutra doesn't fall into that category i mean because i took to gomutra as an example the i am elaborating on that but that is how i would see that the the religious practice praxis and or politics of an extreme kind should not enter uh science practice it will still color my thinking it will still color my opinion about my students my colleagues but that should not be a major obstacle for continuing uh, uh, as a student teacher relationship that's how i would put it there are always extreme situations and it's it's not a something that one can simply generalize but yes there are problems which are also increasing of late and i do see that this might become worse that that was it's indeed true. a great question and uh, yeah. that was a great answer as well uh, we really love to hear that uh, and, uh, do we have a few minutes to take questions from the chat i don't have anything until 7 Okay. okay. Uh, so <laughs> 6:30 I thought ha huh, indian time there is always delay so let it be. <laughs> okay. So Asmi asks uh, uh, is it possible to pursue research in the field of immunology without having MBBS because most immunologists uh, have an MBBS? No, most immunologists don't have MBBS. Who are the immunologists you know of if you are talking about I sir it's only Satyajit and me no. and it's an accident. Complete accident. Most other immunologists I mean there is something called uh molecular immunology forum of which both he and i are a part of uh, and in that there are probably one or two other medically qualified people everybody else is straightforward phd no there is uh, immunology is not homolytic again the kind of immunology research that i pursued always had a medical angle to it because my training was in medicine so i would think of whole animal vaccination immunological memory how will it help in this that and the other but there are there is something called molecular immunology there is also cell biology which is part of immunology as in transport of vesicles and so on and so forth a lot of this is also distinctly distinctly sorry linked to diseases also 
or they may not be linked to diseases. So immunology is not only about needing MBBS and then doing PhD or MB MBBS MB. Straightforward BSMS and PhD is also perfectly possible. In fact, uh, I had only one when I joined uh, ISER in 2017, January, I had a fifth year student who did a project with me. And at that time, she, we, I had, uh, uh, she, she worked in immunology in, on a project and eventually actually moved on to do immunology PhD. So this is straight BSMS going for PhD. And that is how the majority of immunologists are. So it's it's not not at all a setback or not at all a requirement. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. There was a question on YouTube uh, and chat. Uh, uh, it asked that uh, you probably uh, wis witnessed some of the emergency times, like the times of 1975. So could you tell if that affected academics in general or uh, any of your experience? or memory you would like to share from that time? I was at a very odd age at that time in the sense that uh, I was a medical student. Some of my classmates uh, did go for what were called as sterilization camps, if you are aware of it, that there was compulsory sterilization, male, steril uh, male sterilization that was happening. So that was Sanjay Gandhi propaganda and campaigns that were happening, which ultimately backfired. But some of our, some of my colleagues, as it happened, I didn't have a chance. But this is something that was happening around us. But in general, there was so much of clamp down, clamp down of information that, and you know, we are talking about 1975. So avenues like internet and whatever was non-existent. So getting information was also very difficult. We, all of us were in sort of a, uh, I was at least in a state where I didn't know what was happening. It was unhappiness. It was something that was not pleasant, but I didn't know what to do. I was, uh, I did not even, so after emergency, when the elections took place and Indira Gandhi was defeated, I was extremely unhappy for a personal reason, not because she was defeated. I could not vote. So, so I had not crossed that barrier uh, because it, the voting was uh, at the age of 21 then, not 18. And I had not f completed the age of 21. So I could not be a registered voter. I could not vote. And I felt that I did not participate in this historic decision of toppling of uh, a government which had imposed emergency. I was, of course, very happy that it did happen. But I think we are in a different kind of emergency now. That was a very declared emergency. There was no notion of democracy which was uh, allowed to function at that time. Parliament was not functioning officially. All of that. So it was a real clampdown, real lockdown. Uh, lockdown of a different kind. Now we have a different meaning for that. But that period of you know, national emergency was a very different period. It was, we were aware, I was aware of many people go, uh, getting uh, locked in the jail, spending time in jail. But as, as I was telling uh, somebody earlier, Pra uh, Prabhud or somebody, Prarabh, sorry, Prarabh or somebody else earlier that, uh, if, if somebody wants to do a PhD, I would expect certain input from the person. I told that to myself, if I'm enrolled in an MBBS, I can't, I don't want to get out of this right now because then I don't know what will happen. So I continued with my MBBS and completed it. And by the time I finished, I finished my MBBS in 78, emergency was out, the Janta party government was in. So in a way, I did not let myself completely divert from the path of education that I had chosen because I knew that some amount of education and degree and something that is essential. And at that time, people who were much older than me in the sense, those who participated in the freedom movement, many of them had done this, that they had quit their education and jumped into the freedom movement. And 
for some of them it didn't matter in the long run or at least they said it didn't matter the, to them in the long run but many left their education halfway and after the freedom uh, after 1947 i don't think many of them managed to come back quote unquote back on track to pursue their careers pursue their lives so this is something that i was aware of there were people of this kind in every family at at that time point in the history so i was aware of it and i i don't know how consciously but i certainly did not want to quit medicine and do anything very politically active though i do remember attending jayprakash narayan's um, meetings which happened in pune in uh, nehru stadium and some other meetings all all marathi uh, literatures who were like pula deshpande if anybody knows or durga bhagwat if anybody knows all these people who were really literatures they came out and started campaigning during the um, election process and that was something that was very very encouraging but apart from that fortunately or unfortunately i don't have experience of going to a jail or being <laughs> taken into custody <laughs> yeah that that was rather enlightening because we we actually cannot imagine that scenario our generation at least so no 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 you are, you are you are going through it you are going through it you will realize it later oh okay so you, what i think what about what is happening the... currently is an undeclared uh, sort of um, undeclared state where uh what i'm saying today i'm sure i'll get me into trouble also may i hope it doesn't get you into trouble but it is something that is happening most of us are not able to express ourselves freely and if there is anything that gets said there are uh, point uh, there we we get criticized and uh, i hope not physically but verbally certainly get attacked so this is uh, this is exactly what was happening in the uh, emergency uh, period of 1974 uh, 75 as well so <laughs> you you will eventually okay. okay. <laughs> all right um there was another question which says uh, the society uh, prefers mbbs or engineering for financial reasons and so what are your opinions about that and what did you experience uh, the one who wrote says that i believe nobody can give justice to the question better than you <laughs> no i don't know whether i can do justice or not but all i'm saying is that when i was trying to think about research options this was one major um, point that everybody who was a practicing doctor in some fashion made that you know uh, as as a practicing doctor which means essentially private practitioners you can earn a lot of money if you if you become um, a researcher you know you are closing this option so i said to myself and said to them also people who do have not done mbbs or people who haven't done engineering though i didn't necessarily justify engineers at that time people who haven't done mbbs but have done bsc msc phd and are uh, university teachers they get salaries they seem to be happy i had many many senior friends of mine who were in such a position they were earning their livelihoods and they could survive pretty well they were not the poorest of the lot so why should i worry of if i don't get too much money as long as i get enough money to keep myself going i didn't care and i in that sense my choice was for what would keep my interest rather than how much money would i get if i didn't get any money at all i would what i would have gotten worried but i knew that once i become a researcher i essentially am like any other faculty member in iser today that you know it's a lecturer's job or a, a professor's job or something or the other and they get proper salary i got proper salary and it was never never really um, very insufficient kind of salary so yes i let go uh, private practice because i did not uh, because i uh, opted for a research career but engineers at that time especially the iit guys most of the iit graduates went outside the country that was very very common 
at that time when i was becoming mbbs fewer of our, my classmates went outside afterwards there was much higher percentage who went outside and settled there but engineers especially the iit engineers most of them went outside and again the or uh, the the difference is be versus btech so btech which is the iit degree those went outside and be engineers were considered sort of you know not that great and they found jobs in different uh, different um, companies so many of my classmates from school uh, worked in bajaj and crompton and whatever the various companies that are there uh, in pimprichinswad area today so getting uh, engineers didn't necessarily earn humongous amounts of money because they they also went into uh, jobs but doctors could also either go into jobs but most doctors practiced pri uh, did private practice and most of them earned a lot more than i ever earned that's all right i i don't i'm not complaining about it i was not after money and that is something that you people need to think about because again money if money is your very high priority there is no point in getting into research seriously because it gives you enough but it doesn't give you you know the kind of money that it people get or lawyers get or mbas get they that's a different kettle of fish i'm told there was enlightening uh there there is a follow up question to prarab's question that uh, how does one go about the present situation like there are certain factors which one cannot change caste location gender and sexual identities and many of our peers including myself referring to the one who wrote the question get anxious yeah, thinking you. about it and given that they we have no exposure how the dynamics of lab works would you like to give some direction of how do we handle this situation it, it is very um lab chief or whatever uh, investigator specific there are lenient people there are people who demand whose demands are very strict so generalizing is very hard if you are talking about uh, enlightenment in the areas which are outside the sphere of simple research or simple bsms then i think there are enough opportunities in icer itself and also outside in pune since uh, icer pune is where we are having this sort of uh, notionally speaking uh, this uh, program so there are enough opportunities even outside so that you can get a sense of what the reality in life is and the reality in uh, in life for all sorts of underprivileged categories which i mentioned uh, many of them those we will have to change and in that sense not just me because i mean i said how old i am and i'm not going to be very active for many more years but there will be people from younger generations who will do a lot more work and as compared to where we were in uh, 70s or early 80s things are different to many extent for underprivileged people and i'm using that as a category don't don't misunderstand uh, because of my clubbing everything together but that uh, um, their status has improved to a significant extent even the lgbtiq community is much more open today than it was earlier because of the uh, 377 judgment which came in came about re got reiterated and so on and so forth so there are these issues for women also uh, since i worked as as a feminist activist for women also many laws have come into existence but having laws and having changes in the um, attitude are very different things this is something for which all of us will have to struggle and the people who struggle to bring in quote unquote equality are always in minority because otherwise there is no reason to fight if everybody is equal which many people think they are uh, the society is Uh, consisting of equals then they, they there is no activism in their lives but people who notice inequalities uh, and think about it and worry about it those are the ones who for whom 
the struggle there is a struggle ahead and we need to do whatever we can in whichever fashion we can but as i said about if the question was originally focused on uh, research that is a very very individual equation that you will have with i don't like the word but with your supervisor mentor advisor whoever it is uh thank you uh there was another question in the youtube chat uh which says um what changes do you see in iser pune since your joining in terms of uh, academia teaching and culture uh actually i as i said as compared to delhi delhi is a different city it has its own dynamics again national institute of immunology is 30 year old maybe 35 year old institute and the people there are dif a different lot so as compared to that i was quite enthusiastic about iser iser's culture because i i had never been to a place where there were undergraduates and i i is only our student population was only phd students so it was a very different kettle of fish teaching was a different of a different kind and um, it was primarily a research institute so coming to iser in a sense was my first experience of working in a university like situation where there were many 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 youngsters and the dynamics is quite different so i uh, i have been in iser only for uh, for five years close to 5 years now so in a sense uh, there was lot more interaction earlier honestly speaking the pandemic has changed a lot and for that nobody is directly responsible as in iser community or something but the funding situation has changed everybody every faculty member is extremely worried about his her own future career trajectory i feel i'm damn lucky that my research career ended when it ended because those youngsters who are there and also eventually i hope by the time you become researcher situation will be changing for much better but those who are in research career today are finding it extremely difficult to get money get funding support and be productive and you know move on in their careers so i don't know how much of that is going to affect iser atmosphere in the long run i hope not but academic activities have not started which is something that i hope will start soon academic in the sense uh, sort of seminars physical seminars or mm -hmm. faculty uh, seminars have not started i don't hear science from any of my colleagues which is something which is extremely sad because that's that's the fodder for thinking and that's the fodder for surviving in a sense in research which is not happening so uh, this this atmosphere is extremely difficult i gather from january there are going to be real classes and yeah. hopefully things will improve for the better yeah. but uh, it is it is a different iser i must admit yeah. okay yeah, but perhaps all this is temporary and we'll eventually get back we we hope, hope so too the student community seems to be very active in clubs and also do we do have a culture there uh, and so we, we and as part of you know people running clubs i we would all like to try to keep the uh, uh, energy up sure uh, we should <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, if there are no no uh, no more questions i think we can end this here uh, sure. thank you dr vinita bal for giving your uh, precious precious time today uh, <laughs> uh, and we, it was really fun don't, to have you speak don't here don't embarrass me by saying <laughs> precious precious time <laughs> okay okay yeah Th thank you thank you very much for coming sure. I also enjoyed uh, talking to you guys and the questions. Yeah. Quite probing. <laughs> Thank you. And ho hope to see you on campus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Uh, Thank you.